Amazing. So we're now an hour into SEMrush's Global Marketing Day with 23 hours to go. So get some caffeine, go for the long haul. We're here all the time. Um, so I'm Harry Sanders, Director and Head of Search at Studio Hawk. So your host for the next two hours, live from Sydney, Australia. And throughout our presentations, post the most valuable tips and tricks on social media using the hashtag Global Marketing Day. Now, We've already had some great conversations with some of the panelists and uh, things about organizational functions and content to cut through the noise. But what about SEO? My favorite topic. Our next presentation comes from Michael Briggs, head of acquisition at Canva. Currently leads teams at Canva to deliver high quality user growth, SEO, performance marketing, affiliate, CRO, and localized content on web and mobile app. Is there anything you don't do? Uh, at the end of this presentation, we'll open this up to a 15 minute conversation. But first I'd like to introduce the other experts in the studio. First, we have Peter Mead, a WordPress SEO consultant, and James Norquay, founder of Prosperity Media. Peter Mead has been getting traffic for websites since before WordPress, SEO, or Google existed, and is active in the SEO community in Melbourne. We call him the godfather of SEO here in Australia. And James Norquay has over 14 years of digital marketing experience and worked with large corporations such as Virgin Mobile, Woolworths, Citibank, and Home Away, Home Away to drive growth from SEO and content channels. So it's time to dive into SEO at scale, growing your results faster by managing inflection uh, points. Take it away. Hey, um, my name's Michael. Um, just so you know, this is my horrific ego slide. Um, first of all, I'm Scottish. There is no subtitles, unfortunately, with this presentation, so I apologize in advance. Um, the rest of the things there are not meant as suggestions and reasons to believe me, but more lists of the things that I've done wrong over my time um, inside working. Um, so why should you believe me? Um, first of all, Scotland invented the search engine crawler. We actually invented this, click on the BBC link and you will see this. Um, that is a proof point if nothing else. What I'm here to chat about today is these junctions that we reach inside SEO where there's certain decisions and things that are going on inside our lives that will define whether we reach success or whether we encounter failure. We see these all the time inside SEO. Think about every single Google update where we have no idea what actually our response should be. Or we wake up one day and someone has updated our robot's text file and accidentally removed their entire website from Google. Mm. These things are consistent in the life of an SEO. And in management culture, we often talk about these quite differently. Um, inflection points are really events that result in significant change inside the businesses that we work inside. Um, they're significant in terms of their depth and their size and their impact and the impact of the entire organization, an area that we work in. And they're often a sign that we have to change the way that we think about everything that we're doing. In reality, what worked yesterday won't always work today. Historically, if we think about the search demand curve, really where everyone starts is do their lovely keyword research, start with the top 100 keywords, try and write content for these sort of really high volume terms. And most businesses, when they realize this, then say that for good SEO, we need good content. Let's hire a copywriter. Let's hire an SEO content specialist um, because we don't want to go into links. We're generating those normally through the PR and everything else that we're doing ourselves. And we end up with an SEO team, which is really one person. Um, the workflow looks ridiculous. They do keyword research. They write articles. They're constantly uploading, publishing, reading more about what they should be doing and trying to find different ways to get that content in front of people and outreaching it. And what we find is that the more URLs we publish generate more traffic and the more traffic we generate, we get more sales and the economics are really in our favor. We find we can model out the entire funnel from the number of searches down to the revenue that we predict we will make with a reasonable degree of accuracy. And this means that we end up in a situation that we're focusing on these really high, valuable words. And the more successful we are, the more our bosses believe in us, um, which is always good, okay? But where we end up is that we move down this keyword spectrum and we start looking at smaller search volumes and different things that mean the economics start to move away from us. And this means our economics of content production now actually go against where we need to be. We're now chasing search engine rankings. We're now generating less revenue per page. And where we end up, 
is really in this section where we move closer to failure than ever before because we can no longer justify the money that we're asking our bosses for because the revenue just doesn't balance up. Our customer acquisition costs are now greater than our LTV. And even if we extended the amount of revenue we may make from some of these users out to infinity, we will just never see that return. Um, that does not make businesses happy. Um, and normally you find that at that particular point, we reach an inflection point and we have to choose what to do differently. And at this point, normally what happens is we need more content, so we need to do this faster so we can generate revenue faster, but we want to moderate the costs. We want to bring this down as far as we can. Um, so we either hire people who don't really know what they're doing, or we start to outsource the content. Um, we find all the great online tools that allow this to be done really, really cheap. And what the workflow looks like is exactly the same, except our SEO is now actually managing the workflow. And really, we start hiring editors to now manage the numerous writers so we can try and get the economics back in our favor. And this just means we amplify our content. We start building not just landing pages, we start chasing micro moments, believing that if we get that coveted position zero, everything will be great. We start generating blog posts and going after queries that are deeper and deeper down the funnel. We build how-to guides, marketing pages, content to onboard users who have already seen us and already know us. And we start doing content marketing because we believe that if we do these things, we will generate links. And really our expert SEO is merely coordinating. They're not actually doing any SEO, purely they're in a management phase. And this is like one of my favorite graphs of all time, um, which is around the concept of content shock, which is we are now producing as a species more content than anybody will ever actually consume. Most content will exist with a few people to no people actually seeing it, and we're just creating exponential waste. And we're doing this to chase search engine rankings. When I pulled up some example queries. I was looking at things like infographics. What are we making? 25,000, 300,000 results. Um, Chinese restaurants in Sydney, 196 million results. Time in New York right now, 5.7 billion pages are actually talking about all these things. 99.999% infinitum is never going to get seen. And someone has paid for this. That is money that these businesses will never get back because an SEO has said that writing more content is the right way to go. And really where our business hits this inflection is that our growth is now limited by human capacity. Each URL we publish generates less return or no return and the investment per URL we're having to make is always constant because there's only so far you can drive down how much you're willing to pay someone and the quality of content we receive. And if we make the wrong turn here, what we do is we put ourselves out of business very, very quickly. And success means that we have to find a way to start managing this equation better. This brings us into a content arms race, where really what we're trying to do is work out how we can scale content more quickly and more cheaply than everybody else because that will make us successful. But all the terms we're now chasing, we can't actually find. You can't go to the Google keyword research tool and find out all the keywords that are hiding inside the long tail. Google will not even give you that inside your analytics these days, hiding those queries. And even if it did, there's so few people now looking for these queries that is no longer economical for us as businesses to write. And that means our entire business has to reorganize if we're going to continue to be relevant and useful inside search. And we often talk about this sort of progression from how much content can an individual make and how much work at a network scale, how much can one person manage and how much can they actually coordinate through to internet scale, where people are actually just sitting at their computers writing code and only if we had internet scale. If only our content was like Facebook, where it all came from free by users. If only it was like Google, where we could just scrape it and repurpose it for other people. And what we actually very often hit on is that success lies at this waypoint between SEOs and engineering. And unfortunately, very often SEOs and developers don't actually play very nice together. Um, increasingly, what we're seeing is that as SEOs and developers get into a room, the languages they talk, the way that they think about problems, the way that they explain it to each other actually leads to friction. And actually the biggest problem that many organizations find is when their SEOs stop being marketers and actually move in to becoming technical marketers and actually driving that relationship. And we end up being stuck with three questions, which is why are we doing things? How are we doing them? And what should we actually be doing next? And how do we get these things out to production? 
and Rui, we actually asked the SEO to perform three functions. We asked them to become an SEO. What is your expertise? What is your craft? Be a product person. Define the products we have to build. Work out how to manage that workflow. And then work with a bunch of engineers who actually are not really that interested in this particular area because the code they're releasing might never get seen in the same way that all the code that's inside your product will be. And this creates a new tension and everything pulls in three ways. But here we find that SEO is a participant at the right tables. Everything's now in negotiation. They can no longer be responsible for everything because they're not actually executing. They're now providing guidance. They're now having to work in a network. And that causes now personal tensions. And where we fail is on one side. And where we can be successful is how we overcome these human interactions. And normally where I see organizations is that choice one is the SEO becomes a dedicated product owner. If only they could manage the workflow better, then everything will be wonderful inside the world because that means we can get things done. Choice two, SEO becomes a manager. Let's work out how we can build teams of teams and have them lead different people through these different inflections that are now challenging us because we're no longer growing. Um, SEO is a fighter. This is almost where I see very many SEOs at times, the angry SEO. The one who's frustrated on Twitter saying, my engineers will not do what I ask them to do. This is a stage where you know that you're about to encounter a problem because the frustration's high. And when the frustration's high, that means your teams aren't working. You should be watching your people and understanding their frustrations at all time because that's the only way that you understand whether things are truly going well or truly going badly in the future is because it's a predictor of future behaviours. Choice four is that we really just turn the SEO team into a new sort of form of scientist um, and we say run experiments because if we run lots of experiments maybe we don't actually require you to actually manage workflows or manage people. We can put you back in a little box and you can just run experiments to your heart's content and we will scale the learnings for you. And the SEO feels sort of disenfranchised from the ongoing workflow. This brings us to truly the illusion of choice, which is the SEOs in most agencies and most companies these days are being asked to be everything to all people. The SEO is now your product owner. They're defining the workflow. They're data scientists. They're working out how to count. They're probably harassing the data teams because they can't find everything that they want and everything's not joined up. They're now working with engineers and they're responsible for engineering that's actually happening to every single user who's visiting you. They're now a line manager because they have to line manage because you need multiple SEOs to now achieve everything. And they're also now responsible for every single thing else which is on the internet. You're now a taxonomist. You're now an information retrieval specialist. PR consultant and all the way through. And increasingly what we find is that the SEO now sits at the heart of these companies. We're now at a scale where everything is actually now about our product becoming our SEO, our SEO becoming our product. They're not actually separate, but your SEO asks are now getting bigger and bigger and the number of people you require to do things is actually significantly more difficult. So as we move forward, we enter on certain terms. We enter this point whereby the path to success is no longer clear because we're no longer counting in a deterministic basis. We're no longer making one piece of content and saying, how many users did that one piece of content improve by and how many changes can I make? We're now playing probabilistic games. We're changing 10,000 pages with one sort of quick engineering keystroke and we're trying to work out was it a good idea or a bad idea across the entire portfolio, understanding that we'll win some and we'll lose some. And our game is now about what percentage gain do we believe we can make? Because now our growth goals are really big because you're a highly mature, highly engineering focused. You have a team that's 20 to 25 people. You're now driving change at that sort of scale. You're no longer just worried about making one piece of content at a time. And this now means that your inflection point is increasingly an unclear path. Your business will ask about low hanging fruit, but you know there's a decrease in silver bullets. Your team's now growing exponentially and you need to rebuild your own skills. How we get out of this now becomes how we're successful for the long term. And this leads to what I call the SEO's existential crisis, which is where am I going? What am I doing? What is the meaning of life? Do I want to do content? Do I really want to build links anymore? Do I really care about what my HTTP headers say and if my tooling's correct? And really, this is for SEOs enter the point that you generally see in a pub most days at 5 p.m., which is head in the hands wondering, what's next? Where do I go? 
I found that there's a set of questions and ways of thinking about each of these individual phases of SEO growth where you can start managing the risks. Um, and these are questions I stole. Um, like all good SEOs, I copy, I steal. Um, original thought does not exist on the internet. Someone's already done it. Um, I am sufficiently competent and skilled at my job. Really, from working with teams, we're trying to understand how can we help them learn and upskill. Is there someone better who can do this than myself? Should I delegate, invest in team training, or hire someone better than myself? Do people actually know what they're responsible for? And when they're not clear, are they willing to ask? Do they have the psychological safety to be able to work through inside different areas and be willing to say that things are unclear and that things are difficult? And do they understand the boundaries on how much we're actually asking of them and is it too much? Do we understand that people are willing to say, hey, I don't understand this. I don't trust the team I'm with. How do I start building trust? I'm not the expert. I should know all these things. I get paid to be an expert. But with so many questions and so many specialties, there's no way any one individual can answer all these at once. So we have to get people in a real position where they're willing to say they can't understand everything. Do they understand the business goals? Can they actually make impact on the thing the business wants so that we can change direction, change what is being measured and realign constantly? Because when they have to make decisions, that decision latency has to be very short. They have to be able to sort of like wake up on a Monday morning, see there's been an update and by lunchtime potentially have some changes out if something really bad's happened. The ability now is to respond and execute. It's about delivering all these pieces. And if everything is tied up in bureaucracy, what we should be doing is killing it. We shouldn't reinforce our management structures just to give someone nice job titles. We should sort of be destroying these pieces down and smashing them with the biggest hammer we have to hand. Have we actually given people the resources and tools to carry out their responsibilities? Um, as SEOs, we're fascinated with shiny new tools. There's one every single day. Someone's got a new, small, tiny feature that we will never use, but we've bought into it. And what we actually increasingly find is that the best tools are the ones that everyone's been using for years. There's a lot of the tools in the market which are just very good sales teams but don't offer any value. I would recommend that you choose less tools, not more, and use them repeatedly so that you're getting the full value from them, so that your teams become used to using them, and that everybody inside that business understands when you're talking about the data. It's from this that we can make all SEOs superheroes. So thank you. Amazing. Thank you so much, Michael. A, a perfect presentation for marketers from small or large scale companies looking to scale their SEO effectively. So just, just an FYI, ask any of our experts a question, just add it to the thread at globalmarketingday.com. I know we've got a few and we'll start going through them. So uh, to the panel now, um, I, I mean, James, I, I know that you do a lot of work in SEO and even search. What are the common pitfalls that you see companies fall into when they're trying to speed up their growth using SEO? Um, yeah, so one of the biggest pitfalls that we usually see with uh, companies, mainly large companies, is uh, people, they, they're working on a legacy CMS. So they'll have different people in-house and no one's owning SEO. So, for example, they'll implement 302 redirects site-wide mm. or they'll, uh, they'll make mass SEO changes at scale that will potentially impact their visibility. So you really have to get the whole team on board. And if you're a good agency, you'll, uh, you'll come in there and you'll train the team and you'll, uh, you'll get a correct plan and strategy in place and do a, do a great audit of the, the website and really train up the business so they don't make these mistakes. So mm. really, one of the biggest things that we see is, is mistakes that, that can, be, can be small, but they can lead to larger visibility loss. I mean, we saw a site do a, a, a large enterprise site do a, do a homepage canonical site-wide, and then mm. they lost 40,000 pages from the index. And this was a site generating millions in revenue. So making one small development change like that, as Michael said earlier in his talk, like, a, a robots txt issue it can have a huge visibility impact yeah i'm shivering and, and having you know just trauma just just listening to these things so so peter uh, we've got a question here from ralph um look we've talked a lot about diversification of keywords but what about balancing the time you spend uh ranking for each keyword yeah, rankings. I guess uh, people are still hung up on rankings mm. in particular. And I would say, of course, rankings are important because we know that getting 
more keyword visibility in the SERPs are going to drive more traffic, uh, but it needs to be balanced, I guess, in terms of thinking broader about your keyword strategy, how that's going to um, be, how it's going to play out across your site, you know, mapped to your URLs, thinking about landing pages, and of course, targeting, I think, a lot more than just thinking about ranking for a certain keyword. So I think that's probably mm. you know the best way I can think. Think just stop thinking about just trying to get the go for these rankings. Absolutely, yeah. And, and good advice. Uh, a lot of the times companies are so focused on driving up positions for one individual keyword, and they lose the overall vision of what all keywords are doing to drive traffic to their brand or website. Um, so so really interesting perspective on that, Peter. And. Um, um, Saman asks, how do you make a good team for SEO? Do you give them technical SEO knowledge or do you give them, uh, you know, very basic knowledge of a lot of areas? What, what are your thoughts on this, James? I think to make a good SEO team, you've got to start with training mm. and you've got to start with the right mindset. And something that I always say to people, like, if you want to be a good SEO, you've got to go to events after work. Mm. You've got to read blogs after work. You've got, to, you've got to go to conferences. You've got to put in the hours. And people fall down because they don't put in the hours. Mm. So if you want to be a great SEO, you've got to put in the time. You've got to test. You've got to potentially build your own little website and learn because the best way to learn is by testing yourself. Start your own website. Make a website for your own name. You've got to start with the basics because, um, yeah, that, that's definitely the first element of building a great team is getting someone who knows the basics, getting someone who's prepared to test things at scale. Um, and then it's ongoing. I mean, mm. it takes many, many years to be a truly good SEO. I've been doing SEO 14 years and you still pick up things time and time again. You know, last night I was at an industry event and you pick, you talk to people, and you kind of pick up little tactics and things that you can you can weave into a wider strategy. So, mm. it's it's an ongoing journey. You really have to put in the training. Um, it also depends on the size of the business. If you're a small business, you might not need a, a large team. I mean, we work with clients that have 50 content writers in house, and as Michael said earlier, sometimes you can you can just be a, a manager of a huge business and not actually doing it. SEO. So it's depending on the size of the business, um, it can be a tricky question to answer, but I think you've just got to start with the basics. You've got to learn SEO. You've got to kind of develop over time. Yeah, that's that's my main tip. Absolutely. And it's good to see that you guys are all tuning in for this because, I mean, it's all about that learning. Uh, the best conference is an online conference, I guess, and especially when it goes for 24 hours. So you're in the right place, uh, your house or work. Um, Peter, mm. Look, we've talked a lot um, about the different things, keywords, or teams. I know you're not going to love this one, or you might love this one, but mm. Steffi wants to know about Google's Verta, right? Or the, the new algorithm update um, that we've got rolling out now. What's the difference between the previous rollout? Uh, how does it change the SEO game now? Google's saying one in 10 search queries are going to be affected. What, what is your thought on this new algorithm update? Uh, I think it's still pretty early days to know the impact. Um, I think there's some people who can, who really have thought about this a lot. I think uh, Dawn Anderson, she's had a lot of good things about this. Um, AI is huge, and we know that, um, I guess, getting away from Getting away from the the old SEO and moving into the new SEO of, I guess, being able to please the AI mm -hmm. and machine learning, this kind of a thing. Uh, but I would say, um, yeah, I reckon there's more research to be done to really know the impacts mm. of how this is going to change the game. Uh, that's yeah. That's all I can say at this time. Yeah, absolutely. It is still very early in in the day to see how how this is going to affect it. And a lot of people are well. Google's saying it's about you know the words that are used to describe things to or from. And I think for for most people, especially if you've been following the conference so far, a lot of the things we've spoken about about adapting your content and writing content for users will help answer those kind of things for you already. 
Um, another question I've got, um, maybe maybe for the two of you, is from Gracie. Uh, and Gracie would like to know, what do you think the most important aspect to improve the voice search of a website is? Um, what tools would you use? Um, yeah, so voice search, I mean, you can, uh, you can use SEMrush, of course, to look at featured snippets. Mm -hmm. A lot of people uh, feel that featured snippets are a key element of voice search. So if you're going to, what, what's actually going to trigger voice search? It's going to be a featured snippet. So position zero, as some people like to say. I've also heard some tools refer to it as um, quick answers. So basically optimizing for featured snippets, um, ensuring that you, you have good presence for those kind of queries. Um, also for PAA. So so people also ask. Uh, once again, you can you can look at SEM Rush. They have uh, functionality to see where you're ranking for featured snippets. You can also look into your competitors to see where your competitors are showing up, and you can think, how can I beat them for a featured snippet? So mm -hmm. it can be in, in terms of answering the direct question. I mean, there's other metrics that people feel come into featured snippets. So things like links and uh, the authority of the site in question. So that's definitely the number one tip: is just getting there for right. featured snippets, getting there for PAA and um, yeah, basically using tools like SEMrush to see what's happening. So right. yeah, no, I love it. And and a bit of a hard hitting one for you, Peter. Okay. Um, so James talked a lot about um, featured snippets or position mm. zeros. There's a few people out there now that are saying that position zeros, while they may be great for a, uh, a user, actually aren't converting to traffic to their mm -hmm. website. Do you, do you have any thoughts on, on if that is the case or what, yeah. what are your thoughts around that? Uh, absolutely. Again, we're moving into the new world of SEO. Uh, we're playing Google's game. And, you know, Google is the one who allows us to have position zero. They, they allow us to get that featured snippet. And so... In order to play the game, we, I mean, we know that uh, the majority of traffic on the internet comes from Google. Mm. Uh, they are the giant uh, when it comes to search engines. And so we need to play their game. So I think this is, you know, it, it's, sort of, uh, it's sort of the case of we can't cry over the fact that we don't have 10 blue links anymore. The old days of SEO when we used to be able to rank for keywords and just get those links, you know, dominate the first page and get people to click on our, on our titles, essentially, on our blue hyperlinks. Mm. Th those days are gone. Now we're looking at you know, featured snippets, uh, all kinds of rich results. The SERPs are going to keep changing and we know that we've seen the patterns and that Google's agenda is to introduce more rich results. The SERPs are going to keep evolving. So absolutely, as an SEO, we need to get on board with this mm. if we want to get that traffic, but not only traffic, uh, the brand exposure and that's that's really you know because going back to the question about is there still value there you know um or wh why care why bother mm. getting into position zero well absolutely you've got to do it right absolutely so, yeah from the godfather himself uh, you heard it here first uh, so look just really quick to wrap this up guys in, in 20 seconds what what is the best tip you would give these guys around structuring their seo what is the one thing james um, the one thing is just start with the basics, you know, like do a comprehensive technical audit and ensure that your site is doing things the right way. So a lot of businesses get the basics wrong. Mm. And that's the thing. People are always coming out with new tactics, mm. but you got to focus on the basics because if you're not getting the basics right, who cares about a, a featured snippet mm. if your site has uh, huge technical issues? Absolutely. And Peter? Okay. So... I think planning is so important and strategy is really important. And that includes not only having a sound SEO strategy and implementing a plan, but talking about how you're going to execute. I think this is where this where we fall down a lot in SEO is you may have a big plan, you're targeting your keywords, you've gone and done all the SEO analysis but who's going to execute and going to michael's points about it can get kind of crazy you know you can end up being this angry seo guy if you can't execute effectively because the uh you know this sort of tangle of of uh, mess you know you've built all these urls you can't manage them and so execution is a is a f really serious thing to be able to execute solve the problems and just make the seo happen mm. so you need support from your from your team from your upper management uh from the companies that your clients you need to be able to 
uh, make that execution happen. So I would say execution would be my number one tip right now. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much, guys. It was wonderful having you guys in the studio with us. Massive thank you to Michael Briggs, head of acquisition at Canva, Peter Mead, WordPress SEO consultant, and James Norquay, founder of Prosperity Media. Thank you so much for, for coming in today, guys. And keep the conversation going online using the hashtag Global Marketing Day. I'll see you guys shortly after the next video.